Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode, I believe it's 91 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For the next eh, almost half hour, I'm going to be your renter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. In fact, they should be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, and um, you can send me email uh, if you do. Please uh, include something like, uh, you know, left side of the aisle, your cable show, or something like that in the subject line, so no, it's not spam. Uh, I do answer my email. Sometimes it'll slow about it, but be patient, so I do answer, actually answer it. And uh, if you didn't catch the email address, my website, uh, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around, somewhere around there, uh, a couple of times during the show, and you can get the email address directly from there. Okay, with those uh, introductions out of the way, we're going to start off with uh, plunge right into our regular weekly feature, the outrage of the week. Um, this actually is something that uh, raises it was a little over a week ago that raised this. Um, that was Jan uh, January eighth, to be exact. Uh, this is the name that that Fox News host Bill O'Reilly, who um, he is the man with the world's most perfect initials because no matter how you abbreviate his name, it comes out as either B.O. or Bohr, whichever. Any event, Bill O'Reilly opened his January 8th show with this, aborting babies at taxpayers' expense. He then went on to declare that he and his crackhead, crack, crack staff, um, had uncovered what may be a major violation of federal law. See, the Hyde Amendment, that, that moldy monument to right-wing nuttery, forbids federal tax dollars from being used to pay for abortions. Okay, so what's the problem? Oh my God, Planned Parenthood gets federal funds. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, Mr. B.O. says, I'm quoting him here, Planned Parenthood says it doesn't use that money for abortion purposes, but that's hard to believe. In 2011, Planned Parenthood performed 334,000 abortions, close to half of all the abortions performed in the USA. Planned Parenthood will tell you that they perform prenatal services, but in 2011, it's estimated that fewer than 30,000 women receive prenatal care from the organization. He went on to call Planned Parenthood an abortion mill and an agency that specializes in abortion. He demanded a congressional investigation of the group's funding and what could be a gross violation of federal law, he said. All right, now first off, 334,000 is actually slightly over a quarter of all abortions performed in the U.S. It's nowhere near half. Uh, more to the point, Planned Parenthood would probably perform fewer abortions at a smaller percentage of the total if it wasn't for the fact that so many states and so many domestic terrorists are trying to make sure that no legal abortion clinics exist anywhere in those states. But even more to the point, even more to the point, uh, yes, fewer than 30,000 women receive prenatal care through Planned Parenthood. But 4.5 million got services involving STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. 3.4 million got contraceptive services. And 1.3 million got services related to cancer screening and prevention. In fact, about 97% of Planned Parenthood services have absolutely nothing to do with abortion, except in the way that um, having contraception prevents unwanted pregnancies and so reduces the number of abortions. And in fact, the feds provide only about 45% of Planned Parenthood's funding, and a lot of that is not any kind of grant. These are payments for services provided under Medicaid, which obviously can't include abortions because if it did, the government wouldn't pay the claim. So the question then is, could Planned Parenthood provide 3% of its services with well over half its budget? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I do. I, here's the thing you need to understand. It's tax on Planned Parenthood. You need to understand that these attacks ultimately, really, they're not about abortion. They're not. Uh, that is, they're not about a woman's right to choose an abortion. 
They are about a woman's right to choose, period. Uh, they're about women's autonomy. They are about women's right to control their own lives. They're about women's right uh, to be involved in society, about women's role in society. This, these attacks on Planned Parenthood are actually part and parcel of a way of thinking, or more exactly, a way of not thinking, a way of not thinking that looks back at the 1950s and think that was too advanced. George Will, who is regarded as the great intellectual of the conservative movement, George Will once wrote in a syndicated column that, and I'm quoting him here exactly, back to 1900 is a serviceable summation of the conservative goal. Uh, the attacks on such an established and, frankly, establishment group as Planned Parenthood are just more proofs of the truth of his admission. Uh, and as for Mr. Body Odor, bearing in mind that a good definition of a lie is a statement made with the intent to deceive, uh, Bill O'Reilly has just again proven himself to be a notorious serial outrageous liar. All right, we're going to move on from there. Uh, you may have heard something about this, but you probably don't know the whole story. Aaron Swartz is dead. He hung himself in his apartment on January 11th. He was 26. Here's what you should know about Aaron Swartz. He was something of an internet wunderkind. At 14, he co-developed something called uh, a really simple syndication, or RSS. And if you're online and you have a blog and you want to distribute it, or if you're online, use a newsreader, or if you use any of a number of other things, you very likely are using RSS to do it. He helped to create Reddit, which is now one of the most popular news aggregating sites in the world. He developed the technical architecture uh, for what's called the Creative Commons license. This is a, a way of licensing things. When people produce stuff, original work, put it on the internet, they can license it under Creative Commons, which lets other people use that work, but you must be given credit as the originator of that work. Among Swartz's uh, social and political involvements were the creation of the website Demand Progress which proved to be instrumental in uh, helping to defeat that, that idiotic law, that proposed law, the, uh, it was that terribly misnamed Stop Online Piracy Act. I talked about this at the time when this bill was, was up for consideration. Uh, this bill, in essence, would have given a handful of corporations uh, massive power over what information is on and passes through the, the World Wide Web, and it would have given the government the power to shut down entire domains based simply on a claim by some corporation that something somewhere on some site within that domain violated their copyright. And most importantly, what you need to know about Aaron Swartz right now, and here to do this, I'm going to quote Chris Hayes. At the time of his death, Aaron was being prosecuted by the federal government and threatened with up to 35 years in prison and a million dollars in fines for the crime of, and I'm not exaggerating here, downloading too many free articles from the online database of scholarly work called JSTOR. Here's how that works. JSTOR uh, contracts to digitize articles from, and it's now about 1,400 scholarly magazines. It then sells those articles, often at a high price, to subscribers. Now, this offends free data activists, of whom Swartz was one, on, for two reasons. One, it essentially cuts off a large swath of people from access to those journals. And two, the licensing fees that JSTOR pays for these articles goes to the publishers. None of it goes to the original authors. Now, the thing is, some people, because of their academic connections, have free access to the JSTOR database. Aaron Swartz was a Harvard fellow. He had free access to that database. So he wrote a simple computer script to download what turned out to be nearly 5 million articles. 
In effect, what this script did is that, you know, if you're going to download something, you right click and then hit save as and give it a name and so on. He wrote a script to computerize that, to automate that and have it done at computer speeds. Now, the federal government, when they indicted him, charged that he, uh, his, his activity at JSTOR was detected, his access was blocked. So he, Swartz, went over to MIT, which has a notoriously and deliberately open structure to its network. And the members of that w network also have access to JSTOR. So he went over and uh, he went into a trespass, they say, into an MIT computer wire closet, sort of plugged himself directly into the network and downloaded uh, articles directly onto his laptop. Now, at this point, it's important to recall something. As a Harvard fellow, Swartz had legal access to these articles. So the only real crime here that we can find so far is misdemeanor trespass onto MIT. Despite this, the federal government claimed that he intended to distribute those articles for free on the internet, which would be, which would be stealing from JSTOR, they said. And they charged him with 13 felonies including computer fraud and wire fraud under the 1986 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this is a law that is so infamously vague and broad that prosecutors can, as they did in this case, use it to charge people with felonies for things that otherwise would barely be regarded as illegal. Swartz faced again up to 35 years in prison and a million dollar fine. The fact that this was massive, unconscionable judicial overreach becomes even clearer when you realize that JSTOR, the supposed victim of this theft, refused to press charges. Instead, two days before Swartz was arrested, the Secret Service took over the case. And when his attorneys, when Swartz's attorneys tried to go to federal prosecutors to work out a plea deal, they said, sure, the federal government's offer was have him plead guilty to all 13 felonies and spend at least six months in prison. Now, something else you should know about Aaron Swartz right now is that he suffered from depression. And his lawyers actually told the federal prosecutors that he was a suicide risk. And the federal prosecutor's response, according to his lawyers, was fine, we'll lock him up. Now, we'll never know for absolutely certain if uh, this, this, the, the emotional and financial pressure of this persecution, and I chose that word deliberately, uh, the pressure of this persecution uh, contributed to Swartz's suicide. Um, suicide is always a complicated act. We will never know for certain if this contributed to it. But I will tell you that if it didn't, that was one hell of a coincidence. Now, there are three reasons why this case is worthy of note and um, why um, uh, I've taken so much time talking about it. And that's beyond just the personal tragedy involved. One is the question of why was the Secret Service involved? What was the threat to the nation involved here? What was this threat? Well, according to a lot of people, a lot of people are of the opinion, and so am I, there wasn't a threat. This wasn't about uh, 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 protecting the nation. This was case was being pursued because the government wanted to make an example of Swartz. They wanted to turn him into their scarecrow uh, in order to frighten other hackers. And I actually should correct myself there because he actually didn't hack anything. Nothing he did here would be regarded as a hack in any reasonable sense of the term. But they wanted to turn him into their scarecrow in order to frighten hackers into not challenging corporate and government control of information on the internet. A second question is the law itself, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Again, this notoriously vague and broad law. Any law that could be used to charge him as he did for what he did is a law that is in massive need of a major rewrite. And the third is the issue of prosecutorial abuse. 
uh, or in the words of a, of a statement that Swartz's family and his girlfriend put out after his suicide, referred to a criminal justice system rife with intimidation and prosecutorial overreach. The issue of prosecutors being able to bring down, in essence, the entire weight of the federal government on some individual for some reason other than justice, for some agenda other than justice, but something more involved with, with power or revenge or just plain showing you who's boss, this whole issue needs to be addressed. And actually, there's one more thing. There's actually a fourth thing. And again, this is the reason I actually brought this up. This is the reason I spent so much time on this. The federal prosecutor in this case, the, the, the actual prosecutor, the U.S. attorney for the District of Massachusetts, is someone named Carmen Ortiz. The word is that Carmen Ortiz is thinking of running for governor. If she does... I want you to remember this case. I want you to remember how she was prepared to throw aside proportionality, to throw aside humanity, to throw aside any reasonable sense of justice in favor of pursuing an agenda of raw government power. Aaron Swartz, RIP. We're going to take a break. Hi, here we are back again. Uh, we're actually going to move on now to uh, our other regular weekly feature. It's become a regular weekly feature, which is the Clown Award. And I got to tell you that this week, uh, there was a plethora of clownishness. So much so that I actually couldn't pick one. So we have a trifecta of clownishness this week. I just couldn't decide which of these three was the most clownish, so I decided to use all of them. Our first century starts with the tale of Louis Giglio. He's a minister down in Georgia. He was to be part of Barack Obama's inauguration ceremonies until his past record of anti-gay bigotry came to light and he dropped out. Now, MSNBC host Lawrence O'Donnell commented on this, saying that Giglio was merely quoting the Bible. But one went on from there to point out a few of the other things that the Bible also condemns. Uh, and before saying that having presidents swear their oath of office with their hand on the Bible is an absurd tradition because no one today believes everything that's in the Bible. No one observes every rule that's laid down in the Bible. Now his commentary was rather disjointed, but the point was clear enough once he actually got around to making it. Well, in response to this, our first clown flapped on stage in his size 26 clown shoes. His name is Bill Donahue, and he's the notoriously homophobic president of the Catholic League. Last Friday, in response to O'Donnell, he proposed that, instead of using the Bible, that Barack Obama swear the oath of office with his hand on a copy of Das Kapital which, of course, is Karl Marx's famous analysis of political economy. Yeah, well, clowns are never known for their subtlety. Donahue also defended Giglio, saying the pastor's only crime was being a Christian. He insisted that, quoting him, quoting Donahue, practicing Christians along with observant Jews, Mormons, Muslims, and millions of others accept the biblical teachings on the sinfulness of homosexuality. Uh, none of which of course, responds to, Don, uh, to, to O'Donnell's actual argument uh, about how no one actually believes everything in the Bible anymore. And, but, on, but on the other hand, wasn't it so inclusive of, of uh, Donahue to include Muslims and millions of others, non-Judeo-Christians, every one of them, uh, as including them as people who believe in his Bible? thing is, unhappily for Donahue and the rest of his ilk, it seems that fewer and fewer people, at least in the U.S., agree with him on this. According to a survey done in November for the conservative Christian ministry Lifeway, just 37% of Americans now say that they believe that homosexual behavior is a sin. That is a 7 percentage point drop since a year before. Meanwhile, those who say it's not a sin went up two points to 45 percent 
a clear plurality, and that is a nine percentage point turnaround in just one year. Um, it is always fun when the, when the clown finally gets the pie in the face, isn't it? Okay, our next clown starts with a reminder. Uh, remember Todd Aiken? He was the Gopper uh, senatorial candidate who uh, lost his election, at least partly because he insisted, he insisted it was almost impossible for a woman to get, uh, uh, for a, a, woman, uh, a raped woman to get pregnant because if it's a legitimate rape, the woman's body has a way of shutting that whole thing down. Remember him? Well, Gopper Representative Phil Ging uh, 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 Gingry does. Phil Gingry, and um, he agrees with Aiken. Gingry, a former OBGYN who is actually co-chair of the House GOP Doctors Caucus, defended Aiken at a recent Chamber of Commerce breakfast. Uh, because I've delivered lots of babies, and I know about these things, he said, which strikes me rather like somebody saying that they know all about how gasoline is refined because they pumped lots of gas. And as if to prove that very point, uh, Gingry went on to relate how he would tell couples who were having trouble conceiving to just relax, drink a glass of wine, and don't be so tense and uptight. Now, okay, look, it is true that physical or emotional stress can interfere with a woman ovulating. That's simply true. It's also true that this has nothing to do with rape, and it has nothing to do with what Aiken said, which is about a woman's supposed magical ability to prevent a pregnancy in the wake of a rape by shutting it down. And it's also true, by the way, that a pregnancy from a, from, from a rape is as likely as any other single act of sex. It's about somewhere between 3 and 5 percent chance of getting pregnant from any single act, and it's the same for rapes as it is for anything else. This is just complete nonsense. Um, and by the way, just to confirm his clown status, at that same breakfast, Gingry also uh, defended former Gopper Senate candidate Richard Murdoch, who said in October that he opposes legal abortion even in the case of rape because uh, if a woman conceives from rape, it's something that God wanted to happen. So, yeah, you go ahead. Um, you know, you got, you got raped. Yeah, the thing to do is go ahead, um, go through pregnancy, Go through childbirth um, because, yeah, God's will. Remember what I said earlier about the question of abortion actually going beyond abortion to being about a woman's right to choose, period? Clowns like Phil Gingry helped make that point for me. Okay, our last clown of the week. Earlier in the show, I had one Fox News host, Bill O'Reilly, being our outrage of the week. So it's only fair and balanced that another Fox News host be one of our clowns of the week. Now, I know it's an embarrassment of riches over there, but uh, this was good. In this case, our clown, our winner of the red nose, is Eric Bowling. On January 9th, he accused some school textbooks of pushing the liberal agenda for teaching an algebra lesson about the distributive property in math. Now, in case you've forgotten your Algebra 1, uh, the distributive property is about how addition and multiplication sort of overlap. It, let's put it this way. Since 15 equals 10 plus 5, 6 times 15 is the same as 6 times 10 plus 6 times 5. Okay? That's what it means. Well, in this case, uh, the worksheet was provided by a company called Scholastic, and it has a picture of a girl with a bag of money that says, Distribute the Wealth. That was enough to get Bowling off onto a rant, because apparently math is a liberal conspiracy. He wasn't alone for long, by the way. Co-host Kimberly uh, Guilfoyle declared that the algebra worksheet had put her on high alert to look for the liberal agenda in her six-year-old son's curriculum. Co-host Dana Perino. Remember Dana Perino? Remember Dana Perino? She was George Bush's press secretary, who in 2007 admitted that she was, when she was asked about it, she had no idea what the Cuban Missile Crisis was. And in 2009, she claimed that there were no terrorist attacks on the United States during George Bush's presidency. 
which is true if you ignore the anthrax letters and, oh yeah, 9-11. Anyway, she claimed on the show, she claimed into gripe about some effort somewhere to stop children from playing cowboys and Indians on Thanksgiving. And I have no idea where the cowboys on Thanksgiving part came from. But she said to prevent kids from playing cowboys and Indians on Thanksgiving because experts say the historic enemies of Indians were not cowboys, but the U.S. government. And co-host Greg Gutfeld, I'm wondering how many co-hosts there were here, asserted everybody has anecdotal evidence of this hideous liberal manipulation. I think the only way liberalism can survive is through indoctrination, so get them while they're young, he said. He also said, a lot of this comes from teachers. They get their news from the Huffington Post and their antiperspirant from a health food store. This is the way they live. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean, and I think he doesn't either. Still, not to be outdone by his never-ending role of co-host, Bowling ranted that his son's history textbook was also in on the plot. Apparently, it covered the Iraq War, and, and it, the book said, I'm quoting, the, this is what Bowling said. They were very, very liberally biased, saying George Bush went in there because he heard there were weapons of mass destruction and none were found. It was a very liberal bias to the history books. Which only goes to prove that, as the people say, reality, along apparently with math, has a liberal bias. All right, I got two minutes left. And... Um, not nearly enough time to talk about this, but there's something I want to say. This is Wednesday. This is the day that the White House is supposed to release uh, its legislative agenda on guns. This is when they're going to release their proposal on what they want to do about guns. I don't know what it is. It hasn't been released yet. It's the time I'm doing this. And there's way, way, way too much to talk about here. But there's something that needs to be said now. Already, already, they are talking about gun control groups are already saying that, well, you know, we'll, we'll, maybe, maybe we'll get the, um, the background check, but well, we're probably not going to get anything else. Already Democrats in Congress are going, eh, well, you know, salt guns, eh, it's not going to pass. Harry Reid is already saying that um, they're, the Senate's going to focus on what will pass the House. In other words, nothing. This is another example of what I call uh, preemptive capitulation. They're giving up before the battle even starts. Well, I'm going to tell you something, Harry Reid, and all you congressional Democrats, and you Republicans, and all the rest of you in Congress. There is blood on your hands. Any one of you that does not vote for, advocate for, push for the strictest possible, the strictest possible restrictions on guns, has blood on your hands, and I call you an accessory to murder. That's it. I'm out of here.